Hello, my name is Michael Parker, and welcome to episode 19 of Antidote. Today we're going to discuss the idea that civilizations and societies have a lifespan, a life cycle like that of a typical living organism. Birth, growth, maturity, death. And if that is so, then even if we learn from history, are we still doomed to repeat it? Joining us to, to discuss this uh, via Skype is Mr. Stefan Verstappen. He is an author of over six books, um, including The Art of Urban Survival, and he is also a martial arts expert. He is a disaster preparedness expert. Uh, he's a bit of a philosopher, and he's a uh, visual media artist as well. Very interesting guy. Stefan, welcome to Antidote. Well, thank you for having me back, Michael. I really appreciate being on. I know that you spent a lot of time in China. You um, are a martial arts expert. You teach Kung Fu. And you spent, I believe, five years in China. And right now, before we get into this discussion of cycles of history, you know what? I remember just, it was maybe 10 years ago, Chinese stocks were all the rage, man. And everybody was talking about got to get in this Chinese stock market. And then in the last three weeks, I believe they've lost $3 trillion in liquidity. Um, what, what do you say to this? What, what, what do you think will happen within China? Well, what I think is going to happen in China, and, and which I wrote about in the, my most recent article for uh, the Trends Journal, is that they will do what the other four paper tigers of China, of Asia, did 20 years ago. Um, the four paper tigers in that time was uh, South Korea, Japan, um, Indonesia, Indonesia, and Malaysia. Yep. And, um, you know, they had a, a, a big influx of, uh, a big uh, uh, flush of cash from their exports because they were exporting to the West and they were making a lot of money and, and the stock market went up and there was lots of speculation. And, and I was in Taiwan at the time. I remember what went on there. They were, everybody was crazy. It was like a gambling casino. Everybody had to be invested in the stock market, in the stock market. And it wasn't just the stock market. It was one scam after another. There was, you know, they were speculating on golf club memberships for golf clubs that weren't even built. I'm not kidding. That This is 20 years ago they were starting off fifty thousand dollars for a year membership in a golf course and by the end of the night they'd have these big you know uh, uh, conventions and free food and entertainment and they were selling you know uh, shares in a golf course and by the end of the night these golf course memberships were up to three hundred thousand dollars for a golf course membership for a golf course that wasn't even built yet but listen, the Chinese have a propensity for gambling. That's one thing that Chinese have. I mean, other cultures, you know, uh, may have a propensity for alcohol or, or other drugs. Or, but the Chinese, their downfall has always been gambling. Uh, there's there's scarcely, scarcely a family in China that doesn't have a story about an uncle or a grandfather or somebody that gambled the family fortune away. So, um, yeah, everybody was speculating in the stock market, and then inevitably what happened was it created a huge bubble, the bubble burst, everybody lost their money, those that didn't, weren't smart enough to get out early, and the ones that are smart enough to get out early are the big players anyways, the ones that started the whole bubble to begin with, people that are in an echelon that none of us know about or can reach. So, of course, they got their money, got out, fine for them, and everybody else lost their shirt. And uh, to this day, you can see rotting hulks of condominium projects out in the jungle of Malaysia somewhere that at, at one time was, you know, asking half a million dollars for a condo unit. And now it's just a rotting hulk. So what is going to happen with China? The same thing. Listen, the Chinese government, people, you know, uh, most Westerners don't understand what China is at all. First of all, it's not a communist country. It's a fascist dictatorship. It's a fascist dictatorship on a scale that would make Orwell blush. It is the most brutal, oppressive, uh, uh, dominant uh, political system I have ever read or heard about, even in fiction. It is a nightmare. The country is a horror story. Now, listen. I love Chinese people, I, I've lived with them, I've, I've had many good Chinese friends, but the country is a nightmare. You have a population of people that work 
14 hours a day, seven days a week, with you know one week holiday a year, including Christmas and, and, and New Year's and all that. That is the holiday, Christmas, New Year's, all combined in one week a year. They live in company dormitories. They can barely afford to, to rent an apartment for themselves if they could. This is the life of most people in China now. When you and I go there to visit Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, uh, Hong Kong, um, you know, it looks great. You know, we see the five-star hotels, we see the bustling marketplaces and things like that, and that's great. And that applies to about 3% of the population. The other 97% are uh, literal slaves, work slaves. They're, you know, back in the, the 1920s and 30s, they had the term coolie, which was a, a term that was used to describe really poor, hard work in Chinese that will do back-breaking labor for pennies. Nothing has changed. That's exactly the way it is now, except they have a, a huge big brother system of, of, uh, of, of monitoring and cameras and, and thought control. I mean, it, really, it, it's a horror story. And, but as much of a horror story as it is, what you know, your viewers uh, should understand is this is the life your children and your grandchildren are going to be living. This is what the powers that be want for all of us. This is, that's why they invested all this money in China. I was there in 2001 and I had a chance to see a lot of what they're now calling ghost cities. And these were huge cities built from the, from the ground up with research labs and, and, and uh, uh, colliders and, and, and hospitals, schools, public transit. I mean, it was amazing. Uh, um, futuristic uh, Star War, uh, Star Trek type of uh, 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 architecture, and nobody worked there. Nothing mm -hmm. was going on, and yet all of it. We'd go to all these buildings, and there would be a little brass plaque on the front of the building that said, "Donated by Hewlett Packard, donated by IBM, donated by Microsoft, donated by uh, um, uh, um, you name it." All the big international companies. And I remember thinking, why would these big international companies donate all these buildings here in China? Well, now we know why, because they plan to move all the manufacturing over to China where they could exploit the poor Chinese people, make them work like slaves, and destroy the jobs and incomes of people here in the West to the point where we will eventually beg to have the kind of working conditions that China currently enjoys. Well, let me interject something here because what you're bringing up is an interesting idea. Some people argue that the whole thing, the whole idea behind the Trans-Pacific Partnership is to kind of uh, pulled down China, and um, we've been talking about that here on this show, but let me just say this before we move on. Um, from what I understand, like the Shanghai Composite is back up a little bit this morning, but um, a lot of people believe, and I think there was a guy on CNBC who just said this this, this morning, that the Shanghai Composite looks very much like the Dow in 1929. So I don't know what's going to happen, but it's very serious, and uh, it looks to me like when you look at something like that, and then you look at Greece, where they're just going to kick the can down the road, take another deal, we're talking about markets, and we're talking about contagion, which brings us back to the U.S., but before we get into that, you have an idea. It's a very big idea, and I wanted to express this. Having spent all the time that you spent in China, tell us about this idea that you have about the four ages, because it's similar to P.J. Sarker's ideas, and it's similar to uh, the strauss howe generation's idea, but you explain it very uh, eloquently. Oh, well, oh, thank you, Brett Michael. Um, well, the four ages is um, based on uh, many theories on historical cycles, and what I tried to do is I tried to take all the different theories um, and find the commonality and, and kind of edit it down and, and make it a little bit simpler to understand and that you know encompasses all the aspects of every theory. And a huge part of the theory is the theory of Chinese dynastic cycles. And when you read Chinese history, and Chinese history is the most well-documented history of all the, all the nations in the world, and it goes back, you know, three, four thousand years. It's very clearly and well-documented. And when you go through the, th uh, the, the history of China, you see that the, the dynasties and the cycles of dynasties continue uh, to follow a certain pattern. And the pattern is, um, usually it starts off, uh, uh, 
at the end of the previous dynasty. Now, at the end of the previous dynasty, and the very first history book starts off, the very first uh, record of Chinese history starts off by describing the previous dynasty, the Zhou dynasty, which was, of course, corrupt and, and, and incompetent and uh, uh, brutal and oppressive and um, falling apart. So the previous dynasty falls apart due to its own internal corruption and, and its inability to rule effectively anymore. And there, therefore, follows a period of chaos. And during that period of chaos, the different provinces and, and counties and in, in previous times, the different, many uh, different kingdoms of China, their kings and warlords would all fight and bicker amongst each other. There was a lot of civil war going on, a lot of slaughter and, and brutality, until one uh, warlord or king became successful in wiping out his competition. When he became successful in doing that, he would then found a new dynasty. He would get what is called the Mandate of Heaven, which is a, a very common concept that all rulers are somehow ordained by God. We have that here in the West, you know, the royal bloodline that's ordained by God nonsense. And in China, we have the same thing, the dynasty which is ordained by God or the Mandate of Heaven. So he founds a new dynasty, and that is typically called the Warrior Age. And during the Warrior Age, there is a, an expansion in uh, um, construction and uh, conquering and settling and exploration. And it, 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 it's actually a pretty good time for the people that live during those ages because there is uh, a return to ethics and values. Remember, the previous dynasty was, was corrupt and licentious and, and uh, perverted and uh, greedy. And, and now we have a new uh, dynasty, and the dynasty has to differentiate itself from the previous dynasty. And it does so by being moral and upright. Now, whether or not the emperors themselves really believed in the principles of morality or, or being a decent person, that's another story. But they nevertheless had to behave and act in a moral way in order for them to maintain their mandate from heaven. So these were generally times when law and order was restored and uh, things were being rebuilt after the destruction of the previous age where you know villages, cities, kingdoms were burned and, and many people were killed. So that was a good time. But what happens is uh, the warrior age begins to fade and it is replaced by the intellectual age. And the intellectual age is a time of ideas and creativity and organization and structure. And it's also a pretty good time. This is the time when universities are founded, when libraries are founded, when people start to take more interest in, in, in self-improvement and education. Um, and it's a good time, uh, again, to be alive. It's usually during the intellectual age that the society goes through what they call a golden age. Um, you know, art and sciences has reaches its peak. You know, it's like the Renaissance age would be the intellectual age. And uh, things are very good, but eventually, like all things, it starts to fade. And what replaces the intellectual age is the merchant age. And the merchant age now, the focus is on business and making money and economy. And in the early stages of the merchant age, um, times are good again. You know, people are making money, new businesses are starting up, new innovations, new distribution channels, import, export starts to increase, you know, uh, new resources are discovered and, and exploited. So the early stages of the merchant age are pretty good. We can liken that to the 1940s, 50s, and 60s of America, which is, you know, uh, those were the good old days when everybody could get a decent job and make a be decent living and, and, and provide for their families and, you know, things are not too bad uh, looking back on it now. And what happens though is the merchant age therefore, however, becomes the beginning of the end because as money starts to dominate the culture, because remember previously it was uh, warrior ethics dominated the culture, which meant people that were courageous and brave and worked hard, they were the example to follow. Then followed the intellectual age where people that were intelligent and, and got degrees and studied hard and became sages and wise, 
they were admired. But now we're into the merchant age and people that have money are admired. So now money becomes the wonderful thing to have, but of course money corrupts or it attracts the corruptible one way or the other. The result is the same in that the merchant age starts to degrade into a, an age of greed and merciless exploitation of fellow men and cons and lies and manipulations and anything for a buck until we reach the point which I think we're at today, which is, you know, everybody has to go out and cut each other's throat for a dollar. You know, every interaction with another human being has to be measured by what you can get out of the other person. And this is what the merchant age devolves into, the age of corruption and greed. Now what happens then is that when everybody is on the take, uh, when there's no longer any admiration or concern or, or appreciation for the virtues of courage and intel, intelligence and creativity where everything is down to a, a goddamn dollar, excuse my language, um, the society eventually collapses. And then we find ourselves in the age of chaos, which was the opening scene in our dynastic cycle, which was the previous dynasty, all horrible and corrupt. And uh, the whole country, you know, starvation, war, crime, slavery, and that's where we end up. And so I believe that we are at the end of the merchant age right now. We can see it, you know, the corruption in government and media and banking and business and finance is, uh, is, is phenomenal. And um, a society cannot run like that. It, 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 it falls apart from the inside. It rots away from the inside. And when it rots enough, it will all fall down. And we're not at the stage where it's completely fallen down, but we're on that slippery slope where we're headed down that road and we're putting on the nitrous oxide. You know? I understand. And um, you just got in a lot of information very quickly. I appreciate that. Now, here's what's concerning about this and what's interesting as well. On one hand, you could look at it and say, okay, well, we're going straight to hell in a handbasket. Um, the concerning thing is as these cycles occur, each time around you have bigger guns. So you have, you have farther to fall. However, on the other hand, and you've said this to me before, you can also look at it, which is that, and then things start over again. And I was thinking, even when I was driving in here today, there are cycles within cycles. And uh, you know, the, the, the Vedic literature, I think, points to that, the Mayans pointed to that. And not every society or every civilization is undergoing the same portion of the cycle at the same time. Yeah, uh, exactly. There are cycles within cycles. And as bad as things are now, in, in the article I said, you know, are we doomed to repeat the past if we don't learn from it? Uh, yes, we are. There is no learning from the past. I mean, you and I and probably many of your viewers, we're aware of things. Uh, we understand how society works and we can see what's coming. We ourselves would avoid it if we could, but we're such a minority in society that and 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 the, the vast majority cannot they're incapable of learning from the past so i don't you know uh, could you learn from the past and change it yeah theoretically yes but there's so few of us that can uh, that it will never happen so but the good news is though that um there's a saying and there's an old old proverb in China says, if the roof is rotten, kick it in. And what it means is that there's some things that can't be fixed. We're at a stage where a lot of, you know, we're going to go through a, a turbulent period. And, you know, and that's what they're preparing for. That's what Jade Helm is all about. We will guess we'll talk about later. There's a turbulent period and things are going to be destroyed. But, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing because we can't, turn back the clock and go back to the way things were in the 40s and 50s. It's, we can't do that. So the sooner we get through this period of corruption and the sooner the current economic and government and whatever system collapses, the better because from there on in starts the rebuilding process and a return to what I call the warrior ethic. And it's, it's the way of the warrior that is really going to save us. And what is the way of the warrior? Self-reliance, yeah. honesty, integrity, 
bravery, courage, hard work, those are the things that are going to save us. And the sooner we get into that stage and we'll see that, we see that already. There's a lot of people that are talking about, you know, the warrior ethics, there's movements starting. There are people that are adopting or uh, um, that type of uh, um, um, value system. It's already starting. And from those seeds will come the new golden age. So even though things are bad now and they'll probably get worse, um, but in the long term, and hopefully in the short term, let's get through this, um, in the short term, there will be a return and things will get better. Much of your work um, and, and many of your books, you are a martial artist. You, you are also a kind of disaster uh, preparedness expert. Much of your work revolves around this idea of teaching people very clear ideas about how to protect themselves and their families. And one of these things, another one of your big ideas what we're gonna to try to get through before we get to the solutions is this idea to beware of a certain kind of predator parasitic class that is among us within the human animal. And that is the psychopath. And this is not something new. They've always existed within us. Tell us what the, the part of the psychopath plays in this. Yeah, you know, because, uh, if I were to describe myself, I would say I'm, mostly I'm a philosopher. I just, I want to know things. I want to know why things happen. And I read a lot of history and I, I couldn't understand why this, you know, this evil and the horror and the endless war and nonsense, why this keeps happening. And, and so I, I, I've, I've tried to investigate all the possible answers to that. And the only one that I've come to is that the problem seems to stem from a certain percentage of human beings that are born in every generation, probably about 10%. And these people are living, breathing monsters. Uh, there's no other way to describe them. They're inhuman in their diabolical evil intentions. And these people are psychopaths. Um, that's the current psychological definition for them. Probably in medieval times, they'd be called demons or witches or something like that. Um, but that's the problem. Psychopaths are chameleons. They are born actors and, and they're able to convince people that they are good, decent, caring people, which is the absolute opposite of the truth. These are horrible people. They enjoy watching people suffer. They enjoy enslaving people, enjoy suffering. Um, but they're able to convince us that they're good people and they're able to manipulate us because they don't have a conscience. So they're able to get away with, you know, types of acts and activities you and I wouldn't even think of. Uh, seriously, it's not something that would even occur to us. And because of this ability, they tend to graduate and to the top of any hierarchical structure. So they tend to uh, uh, gravitate to the centers of power. So when you're talking about politics, the great political leaders will tend to be psychopaths because an honest, decent person does not stand a chance in hell of defeating or competing with a psychopath in the political arena. Just doesn't happen. The psychopath will lie, he will scheme, he will blackmail, he will uh, uh, poison and, and, and uh, take money from interest groups, or whatever it takes to win. An honest person is not going to do that because they're honest. And therefore, in that competition, an honest person cannot win, a psychopath will always win. So what we have is psychopaths in political power. Now, where's another area of, of, of power? business, corporations, companies that deal with millions and billions of dollars, um, same thing. The CEOs of these corporations will tend to be psychopaths because if you're competing for a job um, with a psychopath and you're an honest person, you cannot get that promotion. The psychopath will blackmail and, and, and bribe and intimidate and t do whatever it takes to get that promotion, whereas the decent, honest person is, is, is working and, and, and hoping that you know, he'll be selected on the basis of his merit. But in the real world, that 
almost never happens. And so the psychopath will tend to dominate industry. So the CEOs and the big international corporations and all these guys that are, you know, uh, with the big secret TPP uh, 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 partnership deal that they're hatching out. What, why is it secret? Because they're planning to screw us. That's why it's secret. And why are they screwing us? Because they're psychopaths. Every last one of them are. You know, I haven't heard a single CEO from any of these giant corporations that ever you know, came out and said, listen, maybe we shouldn't be making these poor Chinese people work 16 hours a day for, for two bucks a day. No, no, they're fine with that, okay? I Personally, I couldn't be fine with that. And that's why I don't buy from big box stores. I, I couldn't live with myself to support this kind of evil by shopping at their goddamn stores. I won't do that, you know? But none of these people have ever said a word against it. Finally, <clears throat> What's the best job in the world? Best job in the world is a religious leader because here you get paid lots of money and all you have to do is stand up in front of a bunch of people and lie your ass off once a week. And that's all they do. You know, they get 10% of everybody's paycheck. And what do they do? What do they do? They don't do anything. They put on some fancy costume. I call it a dress, especially with the Catholic Church. They're, you know, they're, they're drag queens, for crying out loud. And then they stand in front of you know, two, three, four hundred, about 5,000 people in a huge cathedral, and they lie their asses off about the God and the Bible and the da, 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 and they collect all this money, and then they go home and they molest some kids. Who but a psychopath could do that kind of a job? You couldn't pay me to do that. If somebody said, Stefan, you know, come to our church, and then every week, just pull stuff right out of your butt and lie your ass off and we'll pay you a decent living and then the rest of the week you can spend to yourself. I can't stand up in front of people and lie to them and exploit them and take their money. So who can do something like that? Psychopaths. So the problem, a big problem with our society and what happens at the end of the dynasty is that, you know, in the early stages, the warrior age, a good, honest, hardworking, decent people don't put up with this. You know, warriors do not put up with lying, scheming, backstabbing sons of bitches. But as we progress through the intellectual and into the merchant age, these people start to have greater and greater acceptability. And to the point now where our media, you know, uh, lauds and, 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 and worships psychopathic personalities through our TV and our movie and the music. And this is all psychopathic uh, value system that we're worshiping here, that we're being prom promoted. And so there's nobody to put them in their place. And so what happens is it becomes like an infestation. They're, they're a cancer on society. They, they metastasize until the psychopathic cancer infects every aspect of human society. And it's their influence that helps to destroy our society. Wow. Okay. So now that we're aware of the fact that these ages occur and that there is a portion of our society that preys upon us because they are spiritually and emotionally incapable of empathy, let's talk about some solutions, because basically this is where we got to get our boots on. And this is the message that I take away from. We had to set the groundwork with a lot of hard truth. There was a lot of stuff that people probably do not want to hear that you just said. So now let's talk about solutions, because in your book, The Art of Urban Survival, what you're talking about is the normal guy in the streets. Listen, over the past year, we've seen, uh, you know, we've seen riots in Baltimore. We've seen riots in Charleston. Um, I was here for the riots in 1992, and not just riots of a social disturbance, but then um, there are also natural disorders or natural disasters. People are going to have to take care of themselves, and you are an expert at that. Um, let's look at a couple of these things. First of all, let's talk about the riots, because I think there's gonna be more riots what do people do who are caught in civil unrest? How do, they, how do they manage to protect themselves and their families if they are in the midst of a riots or adjacent to one in their city? Uh, well, being prepared is the, the key to everything. And knowing what to do and having some equipment with you uh, is, is the key to, to surviving just about anything. With riots, it depends. You know, a riot can break out spontaneously at any time and place. Uh, personally, I don't find any use in a riot. So the advice in the book, if you find yourself, you know, let's say you go to a, a, a you want to demonstrate, and uh, it's a peaceful demonstration. You want to demonstrate the G8 meeting or, or the Bilderberg group or whatever. Fine. Or the so WTO you, or whatever. 
Exactly, a WTO. 1999, or, Seattle. Exactly. So you go there with good intentions. You're a peaceful person, and uh, you just want to demonstrate and have your voice heard. However, the powers that be are going to send in the stormtroopers to instigate violence because in all these cases when a riot broke out it wasn't because the peaceful demonstrators decided to become violent it was because they sent in the shock troops uh, to stir it up and they do that on purpose of course they're going to send in the cops and in the, the police have specific instructions to be brutal you know if it's not in you know, written instructions, they certainly know. Go in there, bust some heads, don't let these people get away with it, teach them a lesson. That's the attitude the cops go in there with. You know, they know it, I know it, you know it. And the purpose of that is, it, it, is to get the people to react to the violence inflicted on them by the state. And then once they react, then the cameras come out and the news, uh, the, 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 the phony news journalists will come out and say, oh, look how terrible. These peaceful protesters, they're all so violent and they're throwing rocks through windows, even though it turns out afterwards that all the, most of those instigators were police in undercover clothes. You know, here in Toronto, they, it, 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 it turned out that the police were the ones that set fire to their own police cars, you know, but we didn't know about that for a year, but before, before we found out out about it they, they they ran the stories that rioters torched police vehicles you know um, so it's to demonize the protesters and that's why they do that so you start off you, in a peaceful protest and now you end up in a riot and that's going to happen more and more right now you know anytime you want to go out and demonstrate or, or uh, march or have your voice heard you'll see they're going to try and turn this into a riot and if it you know people get hurt or killed even better because it's all meant to demonize your protest. So once the violence breaks out and a protest turns into the riot, your best, best choice of action is to get out of there. And so in the book, I have some examples of how to get out of the crowd. Like, you know, don't go against the crowd. Um, don't follow the crowd. Sort of go diagonally. Get out of the main street. Get off the, uh, try to get into the side alley. Duck into a, a building lobby or into a, one of the stores. And maybe go out the back door and uh, into the alley and, and uh, just get out of there. Especially once the, the riot control agents start flying. And uh, But also, when you go to a demonstration, now bring a little emergency kit. And I call this the protester's emergency kit. And that is a, a, a small uh, first aid kit, you know, some band-aids and some antibiotic cream in case people start throwing rocks or you get hit in the face with a, uh, a tear gas canister or something like that, that, you know, somebody can patch you up right away. <coughs> the other thing to bring is uh, um, extra water. You'll get dehydrated. You'll be um, cut off from uh, access to stores and water and, and, and public washrooms. They always cut the, block those things off. So bring extra water, a little bit of extra food. Clothing, wear cotton clothing. Don't wear the synthetic stuff because when the fires start burning, because they'll often throw Molotov cocktails to set garbage cans on fire, and even the tear gas canisters can cause fires. So uh, cotton clothing, wool clothing won't burn as easily as the synthetic stuff does. And uh, even a spark can set, you know, some synthetic pants and shirt right on fire. It'll melt into your skin. You'll never get that stuff out. You have to take the skin off with it. So wear the proper clothes. Also uh, bring good shoes. I see people protesting in slippers and sandals. No, because at any moment, projectiles and guns and the Molotov cocktails could be flying your way and you will have to run for your life and you can't do that in flip-flops. You need sturdy footwear um, so you can get out of the way and there's going to be broken glass and bottles and, and, and stones and, and things on the ground and, and uh, uh, you know, things, uh, yeah. So you don't want to get yourself all cut up. So sturdy footwear, proper clothing, an emergency kit, and I also would recommend bringing a bicycle helmet. You know, protect your head because uh, projectiles start flying and uh, you can always put on a bicycle helmet and then you, you know, look at how the cops come dressed to a protest. They got the face shield, they got the helmet, they got the, you know, two or three weapons on them, they got water, they got handcuffs, they got knee pads, shoulder pads, chest pads, hand pads, Kevlar gloves, they got batons, you know, they come dressed for war. Right. And you're there in a t-shirt and flip-flops, no. Now, maybe something, maybe the demonstration will go along fine and, and you never have need for anything other than that. 
But these days, I don't put much faith in the powers that be not to try and instigate violence during a demonstration. So you're entering a war zone, dress appropriately. I understand. And, you know, when I look over this particular book, I mean, it's 300 pages, I believe. And, I mean, there are probably dozens of scenarios that you describe for uh, how to avoid certain situations. Um, I guess a lot of this comes from your experience in martial arts because there is a bit of a, a way that you think and carry yourself in society um, th that makes you not a victim. I mean, you have things in here, uh, defense against carjacking, car breakdowns, car emergency kits. You have defense against a robber or a drunk. You have defense against sexual assaults. You have defense against stalkers. Many more things that we can go into, but what I wanted to explain to people is that there are within this book, and, and, and you're not the only person saying this, but, but you put it in a very concise form, is that there are things that people can do that make a lot of sense. Not pie in the sky, not crazy nutter, you know, rainbows and unicorns kind of ideas that you can protect your family, you can protect yourself, and uh, just get your boots on and, and, and be ready. Yeah, you know, I wrote the book. Now, the book is, it doesn't include any conspiracy theories no. or my views of uh, what's going to happen in the future or anything like that. But it is an outgrowth of the theory of historical cycles. I, I really believe, and I hope I'm wrong every day. <laughs> I say, please let me find something to prove me wrong. But I'm, I hope I'm wrong, but we are heading towards that age of chaos. Now, what happens when you read history, when civilizations go through this period of the, the decline of the empire, you know, Rome went through it, England, France, Japan, China, hundred dozens of times. Uh, what, so what happens at the decline of the empire? Well, we see what we are seeing now. Crime, corruption, violence, exploitation, uh, government uh, uh, control and manipulation, uh, stormtroopers, the police become more of a problem than organized crime becomes a problem. You know, So the book is aimed at providing you those tools to survive all those different symptoms. So police corruption, symptom of the end times. Government corruption, symptom of the end times. You know, natural disasters, symptom of the end times. Because natural disasters occur because the government that taxes people and, and under the pretext of using that money to maintain the infrastructure squanders that money through corruption and so the infrastructure is not maintained. So when you do have a, a storm or a flood, the effects are far worse than if the government had actually done what it was meant to do, what it was mandated to do, which is that's why we pay taxes for the government to run, you know, to build roads and dams and, 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 and railways. And uh, when they don't do that, then, you know, the distribution and, and the protection and the safety that we have is diminished or or if, if not gone altogether. And a typical example is the, the you know the uh, Hurricane Sandy there in New Orleans. What happened there? Man, that Katrina, be, uh, uh, Hurricane Katrina. Yeah, Hurricane yeah. Katrina. Uh, my mistake. Yeah, Hurricane Katrina in in New Orleans. There you go. That is in a microcosm. Uh, what will happen to the country in a macro scale? Not too much more in the future. Well, here's the good news. Despite all of this, the good news is it's not too difficult to get a few skills, a few, you know, a bit of equipment together, some supplies, and with the knowledge and the supplies, you can survive all this stuff. What happens is people that, when this blindsides them, when these events come along and they're not prepared, mentally they're not prepared, physically they're not prepared, and they don't have the, the, the resources to be prepared, when it hits them, they go into shock. And I've seen this in combat, I've seen this in, 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 the, in a medical emergency, and the shock, what shock does is it shuts down your mental processes and you become as helpless as a child. And that's when people start to die and that's when people get injured. So long as you can, first of all, mental awareness, be prepared mentally to be self-sufficient and to take charge during an emergency. Each one of you are responsible for yourself and your family. So learn the skills that you need, like take a first aid course and uh, 
take a self-defense course, take a firearm safety course, you know, those types of things will give you the skills that you need. Now, once you have those skills, you are mentally more prepared. And, you know, when you have a plan, then you're less likely to panic and go into shock when things get bad. And so long as you can keep your head about you during, you know, whoever can keep his head when everyone else is losing theirs is a man indeed. I think that's a Mark Twain quote. Uh, quote. You will improve your chances of surviving by several hundred percent. And so it's not really a, a big deal. It's just for those people that just don't know what's going on and they're not prepared for anything and they believe that they can rely on the current structure, the current government service, the current police and medical and ambulance to save them, they're the ones that are going to perish. Ste if you, Stefan, yeah. let me just inter interrupt. This week in my own neighborhood, two houses away, a man came careening around the corner um, on two wheels, he was going so fast, he was pursued by police. The man flew up into the neighbor's yard, crashes the car, jumps out of the car, runs down the street. The policeman, who is a motorcycle cop, literally just kind of watched him. So now, myself and the rest of my neighbors walk out onto the street, and we're just incredulous, and we're like, hey, brother, uh, you gonna call for some backup or something here? I mean, and he went that away, and what are you gonna do? And I'm not picking on this personal cop, but what I witnessed was just unbelievable. And uh, literally, probably 45 minutes went by before there was backup. No police copters, no backup of any sort. The reason there was finally backup was a, a couple of women who also lived on our street were so fed up, they finally called 911. And I only bring this up because this was something I witnessed in my little neighborhood that's not in a bad neighborhood. And um, you know, you, you have to be prepared. Listen, I was also here for the 1992 riots. I was here for the Northridge quake. So what we're describing here is not necessarily always at the hands of a nefarious uh, group. It's just life, man. And you've got to be prepared. And it is possible you may not get any help from the police. No, that's, you know, it, it's relying on yourself. And this is, again, the warrior ethic. You rely on yourself. You don't need somebody to save you. Come on. You know, we, we've really lost as, as a society that kind of a warrior idea where you do things for yourself. You can think for yourself. You can figure things out and you can solve problems. We now, uh, you know, we've become a nation of whiners and, and expect somebody else to fix everything for us. You know, it's, it's a mental attitude. We've got to lose this mental attitude of just relying on big daddy state, big brother state to solve all our problems, that the government is going to do everything for us. They're not. Uh, the one thing government always does is make things worse. I've never <laughs> heard or seen, not in history, ever, anywhere, in whatever culture or time of history, that the government ever did anything good. I don't know where people ever got this idea that big government is going to be better for us. It's not. So all it is is assuming responsibility for your life and, the, and, 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 and for the health and well-being of you and your family and your community. So yeah, uh, the cops aren't going to be there to help you. And then when the riots happen, look what it, you know. How many examples? And these examples go back to the '60s, where rioters get out of control and they torch half the city for crying out loud. And then where's the cops? Well, they were told to stand back. You know. Um, so if you're stuck there in the middle of that riot and the city's burning down around you, the cops aren't going to help you. Not even now, during supposedly the best of times, they're, they were told to stand down. So you're on your own. Um, and the sooner you can understand that and make a mental preparation that when things happen, it's up to me and my family to survive it. And that means, you know, being responsible for our own food, be able to look after yourself for at least a month, have enough food stockpiled for a month, so that you don't have to run to the grocery store, you don't have to wait for a government handout for uh, food drops to be delivered to your neighborhood. You can live on your own for a month. Uh, get some medical supplies together so just in case the ambulance doesn't come. You know, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching martial arts here and uh, the biggest number of students that we have signing up are paramedics. And you know why? Because the paramedics, when they go out on calls, get attacked 
daily. And, and it's unbelievable, but that's what our culture has become. Ambulance drivers, when they arrive on the accident scene or a, scene, a crime scene, they're often attacked by the people that call them. So, you know, this isn't going to go on for much longer. If things get really bad, there's not going to be an ambulance come to get you, okay? So you're on your own. So at least have enough medical skills to keep the person stabilized for, you know, two or three days until we can finally, you know, get a professional to take a look at them. But if you think the ambulance is going to get there in 15 minutes, they're not. You're on your own. So learn how to, uh, you know, do basic first aid search and rescue, and get some medical supplies. Not, not a whole lot, you don't need an operating room, but get a decent kit. Not one of these $15 kits from the drugstore, that they're, they're useless. Stefan, we're gonna probably have to leave it there. I, I mean, I didn't mean to cut you off, but uh, we're kind of rolling up, but all of this is good information. Basically, all you're saying is be prepared, look out for yourself, don't depend on other people, which is really just common sense, and perhaps we could all use a big dose of that. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest has been Stefan Verstappen, his latest book, The Art of Urban Survival. There's plenty of just really good common solutions for protecting yourself against getting carjacked, people at your front door, normal situations that could occur. Stefan, thank you so much for your time with us today. I wish you continued luck. I know you're also an artist and you're doing some installations for the City of Toronto. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, my name has been Michael Parker. This has been episode 19 of Antidote. I wasn't trying to scare you. I wasn't trying to freak you out. This was not to be pessimistic any more than looking at a first aid kit is, is pessimistic. We're just in a case where we got to be adults here. We've got to strap in, get ready, take care of our families, take care of our kids, take care of ourselves, and I know you can do it. Until next week, we are the Antidote.